today we'll continue uh, some of the discussion on algorithms in uh, the finite difference time domain code or the FTTD method. I'm Shan Hui Fan from Flux Compute. So um, in particular, uh, today's subject is about the choice of time step uh, delta t in FTTD. Uh, so um, in the uh, finite difference time domain method, uh, what we do is we take the Maxwell equations. So here is, for example, a Maxwell equation in one dimension. And then we convert the differential operator to difference operator. So for example, uh, in order to take a temporal derivative of the EZ field, uh, we just take a look at the EZ field at two adjacent time step, subtract them and divide it by the time step. So uh, in FTTD, as it turned out, the choice of this time step uh, has a very strong influence on the behavior of the algorithm. So here's an example. Uh, in this example, what we do is we simulate uh, a system in vacuum and we put in a plane wave source uh, and we, uh, the plane wave source has a pulse uh, spatial uh, waveform. So we generate a pulse plane wave and we let it propagate uh, inside a computational cell uh, bounded by perfectly matched layer. Uh, and then we put a monitor point here to look at uh, how the field at the monitor point vary as a function of time. So uh, the on the left here is what a good result will look like. In other words, what we expect to see, and what you can see is that the electric field uh, basically has a uh, Gaussian temporal pulse form that pass through the monitor point. And this is by choosing the uh, delta t, the time step, to be uh, slightly smaller than the spatial discretization divided by speed of light. On the other hand, if you just increase this time step just a little bit by 2%, so that the time step now is slightly larger than the discretization size in space divided by C, uh, you can see that the field actually diverge. In other words, you don't get physical result at all. So uh, as you can see from this example, the choice of the spatial, uh, the temporal time step uh, is actually crucial uh, in getting the FTTD algorithm to behave in the correct way. Uh, here, I would like to provide a, a simple set of argument uh, on uh, deriving the condition uh, upon which you can use the choose delta t. Uh, this is called the CFL condition. So uh, let's start with one dimension. So uh, in one dimension, we discretize Maxwell equation uh, in both space and time where the space is one dimension. So uh, here is a representation of the, uh, of the time stepping process. So uh, at, uh, at a particular time step, uh, we would, for example, uh, knowing the electric field, and then half a time step later, we'll use that to update the magnetic field and repeat the process. So in this case, the spatial step size is delta x and the temporal step size is delta t. So the time stepping process as I described look like this. So uh, in the first half time step, we go from e to h. And then in the second half time step, we go from h to e. And then if you summarize uh, this, uh, this is how the data dependency look like. So uh, the important point here is that over a total time of delta t, the information propagate over a distance of delta x. In other words, by data dependency, after we do a time stepping over a time delta t, this electric field uh, at the spatial point of xm plus one now knows about the uh, electric field at xm. So in other words, the numerically, the fastest speed on this grid that the information can propagate uh, is just delta x divided by delta t. Now, 
uh, a physical wave needs to propagate slower than the speed of this numerical uh, dependency speed. Otherwise, the grid could never capture the correct physics. In other words, the speed of light need to be smaller than the numerical speed. And that naturally lead to an upper bound on what you can do in choosing the time step given the space discretization. And in fact, this is the CFL condition uh, in one dimension. And typically we define what's called a Kura number, uh, which is uh, simply defined as the delta x divided by c times delta t. And as you can see, in one dimension, this has to be less than one. So uh, in our examples that I've just shown, uh, when we choose a, a delta t to be 0.99 times delta x over c, this is a Kuran number that's below one, and we get stable behavior. And if it's above one, as in this example on the right, now you see unstable behavior. Similar derivation can be carried out for two and three dimension system as well. And so in two dimension, uh, here is a derivation. As a starting point, this is a single uh, E cell with a electric field EZ component at the center surrounded by four magnetic component, HX and HY component uh, on the edges. Of a, uh, of a square, and this is used for simulating the TM polarization uh, where the non-zero fields are only easy HX and HY. As we have seen in the one-dimensional case, the key point in deriving the CFL condition is to understand the speed over which the information can propagate on the numerical grid. So therefore, uh, let's illustrate how the data dependency or how the information propagate as we progress in an FTTD simulation. So suppose at time equal to zero, we uh, have information about the EZ component at the center of one of the E cell. At T equal to one half times delta T, this information will be used to update all the 4H field as indicated here. So the information has now propagate to the edge of this uh, uh, single square. And if you continue to the next step, now the information uh, of the 4H field is then used to update the electric field component as indicated by these four red dots here. So then you repeat the process. So now uh, in the next half time step, now these are the magnetic field component that get coupled. And finally, uh, if you propagate over two time step, now the red dots here correspond to the electric field component uh, that now knows the information about the electric field component at the center of the grid. So, uh, from this illustration, you can see that for a distance of two times delta t, the, in the slowest numerical speed, in other words, the shortest distance the information has progressed, is from the center of the grid to this point here. And that corresponds to a distance of square root of two times delta x. So the slowest numerical speed is square root of two times delta x divided by two times delta t, which is the time it takes. So uh, again, uh, to derive the CFL condition, you demand that the physical speed, which is the speed of light, need to be smaller than the slowest numerical speed. And so therefore that gives you this relation here relating delta t to delta x. Notice the square root of two here that arise from this being a two-dimensional system. So consequently, in two dimension, the Kuran number, which is the ratio between delta x and c delta t, is now one divided by square root of two. So it is smaller than the case in one dimension. In other words, in two dimension, if you would like to simulate a system using the same spatial grid size, 
the time step that you need to use is smaller. Uh, this derivation can be straightforwardly generalized uh, for a three-dimensional system. So if you go through the same derivation as we have done in 2D, you will obtain this CFL condition relating the time step to the discretization along the x, y, and z direction, as well as the uh, refractive index of the material, which controls, of course, the speed of light, the physical speed of light in the system. So knowing the CFL condition uh, is very important in thinking about various aspects of the uh, FTTD simulation. So uh, here I'll just highlight a few examples. Uh, so in many of the codes, for example, when we use spatially non-uniform grid, so for example, if your structure has small features, you may want to consider use a spatially non-uniform grid so that at the small feature, you have finer spatial resolution to resolve it, but away from it, you don't have to use fine spatial resolution. Now, in this case, the step size in time is actually determined by the smallest grid size. And this is important. Uh, in other words, uh, one will really adjust the time step according to the smallest grid size of the system. Also, uh, this gives an important scaling consideration when you consider the computational cost. Uh, if you use, for example, a uniform isotropic mesh. Now, uh, in this case, the number of grid point uh, scale as one divided by the uh, discretization, spatial discretization to the power of three. On the other hand, if you keep the physical simulation time the same, then the you have to if you uh, then your uh, delta t is related to the delta x, and therefore the number of steps that you would take scale as one over delta x. In other words, the choice of your spatial discretization influence the total time step that you take. So that gives you a scaling of one over delta x to the four. And as an example, therefore, if you, for example, for to test convergence or you want a finer spatial resolution, you decide to reduce the grid size by half. In other words, make the resolution finer by a factor of two. That actually leads to an increase of total computational cost by 16 times if you keep the length of the, the temporal duration of the physical simulation the same. Out of the 16, eight of it come from simply the fact that the grid point, total number of grid point increased by a factor of eight, but there's also a factor of two coming from the fact that you have to reduce the time step. So the choice of the time step here and the choice of the setup of your spatial resolution strongly influence how you control your temporal dynamics. So uh, with that, let me stop here and thank you.